Hello. Um, so the topic for today is content design toolkit, ways of working with product copy, review and ideas. And important thing to point out here is that it's going to be kind of subjective perspective on that. So it's not the only way of working with product copy. And I am Paweł Chłodnicki. I'm a content designer at Duke Planner. I'm interested doing some product design, some accessibility in, uh, in projects at Duke Planner. So that's, that's me. Let's uh, talk about you. I'd like to ask you a few questions like who you are, what are your, ro your roles, so I can maybe better adjust um, the content of this presentation. I will quickly have a look at my mobile uh, just to know, and if you will answer, you will see the, the results as well. So I already see there are quite a few content designers, UX writers, also quite a few product designers. That's expected in a conference like this. Yeah, and some product owners, product managers, and others. Welcome to all of you. This will help us in the next slides. So I'd like to talk today about the reality of content in product companies, or in companies in general. And the reality is that content is usually scattered between different roles, different uh, responsibilities. And it often happens that some part of the content is done, let's say, by product managers creating some ideas for a feature, even naming those features sometimes, or setting up some requirements. Then the thing is passed on to the uh, designers. And then, of course, there are some parts done by developers, like um, some copy is reused, some error messages are coming from the backend. Maybe they are not thought of. So all those things happen. And then you have some external other stakeholders along the way, which is localization, which is marketing in terms of, in the cases of uh, like uh, pricing pages, landing pages, things that are marketing related. But there is a big one. So the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So usually someone like CEO or the client can be really invested in the copy, have some comments, have some ideas, and have some opinion, of course. So that's to be handled. And if you want to take care of content holistically, and that's something you might be interested in doing, it's going to be a struggle, right? Because you might influence, change the ways of working that are already present in an organization. And that was also the reality for me when I joined the first uh, gig, the first uh, company. So I had to deal with all those ways of working, all those uh, dependencies there. And if this content is scattered, you can end up having this Frankenstein, which is uh, Frankenstein's monster, which is kind of um, here and there good, maybe in other places good in other ways, and um, maybe that's something you'd like to omit. And will it be easy to take care of content? I can't promise you that. Like, maybe it's not gonna be a piece of cake, but let's see what, what you, we can do about it. Uh, I'd like to propose you a framework of dealing with that. Um, it's called Epics. It's my own, created for this presentation. Um, and it stands for early, personalized, iterative, collaborative, and strategic. So those points I will elaborate on in the presentation today. Uh, the first thing is early. It's partly uh, explained by Kalina earlier. Um, we are the same company, so you can expect that it's similar. And important point here that is sometimes not obvious is that if you want to do copy properly in your product, the work starts in the same place that product design starts. So 
it's not something to take care of. Uh, uh, later, maybe, um, uh, at least you should think about it as early. And this comparison, this screen is because uh, if you want to run a sprint, you cannot start in, the s uh, in different moments um, and in different start line because your goal is the same and you want to achieve it uh, at the same time. So, again, why is that? Um, it's because content without visuals is maybe telling you something a bit about the page. Here's a screenshot without CSS from NN Group uh, blog. Uh, but with visuals without content, there may be a design, maybe a layout, but you cannot make much sense of it, right? So uh, those two uh, should ideally go together. And on this note of starting early, you may think and le le let's agree that the, the moment that content starts is actually when a feature is named, when you gather all the requirements. I think it's also a good moment to reflect and to challenge. Like if that's not mm, the thing you were thinking of, uh, if that's not um, somehow uh, the thing you, you'd like to do later, maybe it's good to align at this stage, not to have some kind of misalignment in the later stages of the process. And I think what's beautiful at Doc Planner is that we're using this triple diamond methodology, but in many companies, you have some kind of diamond process, right? So it's not you, that unique. But I think the unique thing about it at the planner is that we really do treat it as um, th those people b below the, the chart. It, it's um, all the roles mixed together in all the stages. So it's helping also us content designers to do the discovery work, be aligned from the real beginning, so even before naming a feature, right? And another impo important thing is to make that happen, you need this strong designer duo. That's how I call it. So you need to use the same methodologies, the same tools in a way, and it's best to do it together or be aligned with each other, and it helps you yeah, be aligned, but also you can uh, maybe stress less, skip some meetings because the other person from the duo will, you know, sync with you. It's it's really helpful. Um, so once you've done the discovery properly and you have this pitch document, the thing to get started with, um, in my opinion, quite useful is to have the metrics right, have the goals and aims uh, defined properly. And I've created this, uh, those notes for Figma that you can import to your projects. Um, to, to do just that, have it always inside your Figma file to know what, what you want to achieve. And it's for two reasons. One reason is that you can actually transmit the same communication, the same content differently if your goal is to sell, let's say, if your goal to is is to encourage that behavior or a different behavior, or if your goal is, I don't know, to make something more difficult on purpose, right? When you don't want to encourage some behaviors or they require extra thought. So this really also helps craft the right content and on the other hand, measure the results later on. And when you have that, you can proceed to mapping the, the content with content models or like priority guides that Kalina mentioned. So whatever works, but it's important not to omit this stage of mapping uh, all the pieces of information without the bias of the design. Because my experiments kind of re recently was also like, maybe I can learn Figma, maybe I can be using components always, so I can just do all that things myself and see what messaging makes sense, but it's restricting you to thinking some way, right? It's like always lo-fi for the win. Uh, I will mention that later on too. And here's another example of a similar thing, 
but uh, done in Figma directly, so you don't need to use Figma for hi fi. You can really draw a rectangle, pe uh, mm, insert some text in it, and make sure all the designs next to it will communicate the same things. And this is an example, excellent example from Peter Jan's design. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Some other things you can do, I will just quickly show it and proceed to the next letters, uh, is DevTools. You can play with DevTools. There will be a talk about it later by Patrick. Uh, it's um, helping to get some um, understanding how the copy you're thinking of, how, how changes you're thinking of could work in the design. So I don't know, you could add a CTA, you can change the content of the CTA. So that's uh, something um, you can do. There's also design mode plugin for, for Chrome that allows you to do that even more effortlessly. And uh, another important thing, especially for me, is that if you're changing some existing uh, product, existing pages, you can look up with basic accessibility tools what's the current status of it, like what's, uh, what's the status of the page. You can use Wave, AX, uh, you can use uh, VoiceOver to check if, if it reads well. So uh, I would recommend doing also that, not skipping that step. But then we move to letter P in Epix. So uh, it's important to have this content personalized, but not to a person really. This time it's more like personalized to the situation, to the use case. And this is more of a technical thing. You need to know what keys are and how to use them. Uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but this is how they look like. So you have uh, a CTA. And in code, it's not that they have the content, the wording of it. They're using those keys. Uh, you need to know uh, how to create those, how those are, are created and used in your product. And uh, they should be content agnostic. Uh, they should be unique and clear and have some consistent pattern of creation. So you can track where they're coming from, where are they used, because usually uh, later on, it's, it might get hard to track, like in the code, uh, you're looking up, it's not simple to, to check what key was used. So knowing from this key naming where, where the wording is used is, is helpful. And in this example, you have those levels of naming. So first is the platform marketplace, then homepage, then search as a module, and CTA as a component in the module. And the important takeaway here is that those keys should be unique because sometimes and oftentimes, uh, some glitches uh, appear where you're trying to change something somewhere in the ecosystem, and it might get changed in different places because the developers were thinking search is always search, right? And maybe it's not tailored to a situation. Uh, so this is how it could look like in your toolbox, in your process, that you don't just create content in the spreadsheet or whatever tool you're using for, for that, you should also create keys. And that's sometimes non-obvious. Um, sometimes maybe you need to convince some developers or you know, the, the team that it's you to take care of it, but it's totally the way to go, I would say. Um, then we have the letter D, uh, the letter I in Epics again. So, how would you, how would it be possible to change some content if you don't know the key, if the key is reused, all those things. So, you need some kind of documentation because otherwise you could, I don't know, get, uh, get access to GitHub, learn some coding, search for it yourself. But it takes time on one hand, and on the other hand, if you start asking those questions to the team, they will also spend some time to uh, look, uh, look up things. So we have this spreadsheet, and we can refer back to it, right? You, you, if you created the key, you're the owner, you know where to look for that. Uh, but 
you can also include it in Figma, right? So maybe instead of having this another place for copy, you could just reuse what is used for designs as content is also design, right? So uh, we're going from this thinking about Figma that it's a UI tool to a design tool that is also yours to, to take care of. Uh, you could make a list of, of all the keys in the project also similarly to having it in a spreadsheet but in Figma. Uh, that's what I've been trying to do recently but you could uh, think like how, how difficult that would be and why do that extra work, right? But with variables that are now quite recently Im implemented in Figma uh, I would say it's fairly simple and fairly easy to, to manage all the content because you have this uh, list of all the content keys uh, in, in inside Figma in this clean view uh, on the right. Uh, so it's not that difficult anymore to have all the content pieces aligned and uh, always using the same wording. Um, as intended and you just change it in one place no matter how complex the prototype is for example. Um, so then we're at letter C uh, in epics quite um, quite far already. So this is about like the difference and the um, different tools for different things right. So you can have design tools and copy tools. So in terms of copy tools you might have heard about Frontitude, about Dito and they are um, kind of built for copy, right? So it's a great way to maybe ignore Figma, right? Why should I learn it? Why should I be using it when there's a tool exclusively for me? I can use it. Fine. But I've got a question to ask like which of those pictures you will find more collaborative, right? And if you compare it to tools, I think this second picture is more relevant because if you're using the tools your team is using and that have the comments fu fu functionalities and you can have those discussions, I, I guess it's a better way to go than creating and using some other ways of working, especially in the design process that is by definition nonlinear. Uh, which might be a surprise to you, but it's really not linear. And um, it's messy, right? And we need to kind of embrace it. Uh, it's gonna be messy, it's fine because it helps us achieve better results when we disagree, when we have those struggles, those doubts, and we solve them collectively. It's uh, uh, collective work. And another similar thing on this note is uh, this uh, part from Ryan Wright's uh, talk at config that most of the time you should be doing lo fi or you're doing lo fi and it's fine. You don't need to be worried about knowing, like, you know, UI, knowing Figma, knowing the tools because what matters is this lo fi concept of things so it can be done anyhow and come like uh, the best for it seems the tools that are next to you like you can use pen and paper you can use uh, figjam miro whatever is easy to use for you and then uh, you can communicate your your ideas they can be low fi then they can be bad they can make some discussions happen that's that's fine so those copy tools they promise you to be a source of truth they to have some version history to have discussions but again is that really something you cannot do in those tools others other people know I would argue and I uh, particularly paid attention to this this one benefit of those apps like without stepping on designers toes because I feel like you really need to step on designers toes sometimes even though it doesn't feel good it doesn't feel like you know best but then comes the best solution afterwards so maybe it's worth the effort. So my proposal to it is to really start on paper or in FigJam with mapping that content just to repeat that. Then you can co-create in Figma, 
could be fig jam early on. Uh, if you're not familiar with with it uh, too much, you can use like command D, command click to uh, command click lets you just choose the right text layer without hassle, and command D will duplicate the frames so you don't break, don't step on designer's foot, right? So you're safe and you can edit, you can play with it. And then remember about key naming, you can do that in layers text layers names in Figma. Uh, you probably seen many of those memes around like naming layers in Figma and how that makes you a good designer. I wouldn't go that far. For me it's enough that you name the text layers with proper key names and that's really helpful. Um, and why actually in Figma? Because we're also using spreadsheet at the planner. But when I'm using spreadsheet, I always get those questions like, where is the spreadsheet? Where is the key for the CTA that I may be omitted? Uh, or I already coded this new copy from design and you maybe didn't even see it or someone modified it um, meanwhile. So um, those things happened to me in the past and now it really streamlines the workflow and the developers are happy with this way of uh, finding everything they need in uh, dev mode in inside Figma. And another thing you can do uh, having that and we're doing is that you can push actually your content directly from Figma to production uh, with those copy tools or, con or localization tools but with a plugin let's say for now. And this really um, this is really helpful and it can work the, uh, both ways. So you can even pull the translations from your repository and create prototypes in Turkish for some user tests, right? Uh, even if you don't know the language at all. This example is actually Italian. Similar case. You can download the translations from the repository and have all the prototypes ready. And the last uh, letter is strategic. So I would say it's also about business and here's a few points about it. Um, and this strategic, yeah, it's business but it's also like having a content strategy, right? You've heard that many times probably. And if you need to create a strategy or implement a different strategy or change something in the strategy, it's really hard to do with just Figma tickets and spending a lot of time of developers or uh, convincing the team to take care of something as insignificant as copy, right? So um, all those copy or localization tools can uh, and taking care of keys can save you that effort because there's basically no headless CMS for product copy. Uh, I know it sounds, sounds blurry but there is no tool for editing content in, in your products. It can be real, uh, like simple if you have no code solutions, but in like SaaS products, it's not really uh, the use case. So this can make you think like um, about localization. How does it happen that you have many different localized versions of the same content? And surprise, it's often not in code because localization is a big thing, right? So there is special tools for that. And those special tools for localization make uh, key management possible. And uh, now we're at the conclusion that uh, we mentioned copy tools and now I mentioned localization tools, but why is that? And it's because uh, in, in this long design process, at the beginning it's messy, it's not organized, but in the end you can start using those to track the changes after the release, to be able to react to make changes after the release to adjust the strategy and stuff. So uh, that's when you can use them safely and when they are really useful. And my uh, surprising discovery at the first company I worked for was that you can also use those tools if you just have one language. So this 
can be non-obvious, but it's working this way. So can be, it can be worth the investment in localization tools, even if you have just one language. And speaking of no code, I said you're not using no code for like SaaS products, um, complex products, but you could use some uh, some no code tools to prepare some extra content, and it really pays off. Like you can add extra um, contextual help in in your product, or announce a feature that is maybe difficult to uh, discover or changing it would require some big tickets to be launched to be to be pros uh, done on production so this way you just prepare some piece of content inside this no code tool like uh, appqs and it's already delivering the value and you can check the results if it was really about it or maybe not but you you can evaluate the results so with those two things, you can deliver some business value at almost no cost. So you don't involve like developers and the whole team. You can be just a development team of one and make big changes, impactful changes. And speaking about impactful changes, I will talk about this business side uh, a moment. So a helpful tool is A-B testing that Kalina mentioned, for example. And I know I'm like, she maybe didn't encourage you to do that, and I do, but it's the, the point is the same, that you should combine it with all the research or the discovery before, and then you're safe, and with the metrics, the guard rail metrics, so this way you are good to go with launching an A-B test, and what is useful in doing that is a platform like Google Optimize. Unfortunately, this one is gonna be closed down shut down uh, this month, September. So you could build your own maybe in your company like Netflix does. They have this whole big platform of their own which is combined with all the metrics. I think uh, I recently heard Airbnb is doing similar things. So um, it's good to have some kind of experimentation platform like this. And you can experiment with content only, not Mm, you don't have to wait for some big changes and then A-B test the big changes. You can do the same with small changes. And here's a use case for the planner from Martina uh, about adding a line of text. The project was about like checking how to impact the, the conversion. And you have this header uh, which is telling you what you were searching for, but you may st still not be too familiar with our platform. So what we added was uh, a line about benefits of using our tool. So in this case, it's book a visit online without extra fees. And this is the winning variant. But all of the variants tested, all, all the subheaders performed better than a version without it. So it's a simple change, but quite impactful. 1.66% may not seem too big number, but if you cross it with the amount of traffic we have in the, in the product, it's quite impressive already. And those small changes matter a lot. And um, actually, at the planner, we also have a custom built platform for A-B tests. But in this case, it's for email campaigns uh, related to the product. So we have. Um, this tool connected to our all the our data warehouses, so we can uh, extract a pool of users that did some actions or didn't do some actions, and we can target the campaigns to those, uh, easily splitting, splitting the traffic between different communication, different variants. And here's an example of that: we sent some test campaigns to check if we can reactivate ghost users. Ghost user is, in this case, uh, users that did sign up with us, know the product, but they didn't ever do anything significant. They didn't book, didn't, uh, I don't know, uh, leave uh, opinion about doctors, uh, nothing. So uh, if we just went with sending one campaign, we could end up in 9.7 
percent lower conversion uh, open rate, for example. Here's more detailed results results of that because the difference between different variants was so big and this way we could um, choose what resonates best but all the variants were based on prior research so it's not uh, guesswork but already based on something significant on strong foundations and then experimented with. And uh, then we have another example from Kalina actually uh, where inside the booking flow there was this uh, decision to make when you're booking with a clinic. Uh, if you want any specialist from the clinic or you have no preference which is like no difference right how you put it and it seems like uh, it changed conversion by 16.8 percent in Italy and it's an important point as well like localization and uh, content design here because in Italian you have this difference in Polish it's 4% still fair and big change but a different number right in, in the it Italian market and the Polish market. So what you can do more about uh, making those strategic decisions is research of course and I will just mention that quickly so you can use a platform like Mace to speed up some uh, research some um, user testing and you can do user testing you can do five second tests to see how people uh, perceive your content or what they remember about it. You can use card sorting it's common UX information architecture um, tool. Uh, it's, it's really good for specifically for content or you can use this no field do framework which is usually used for creating crafting the copy right that you should think about now feel and do but you can also use it in research to ask those questions afterwards like how does the user uh, what do they know how do they feel reading your message and what would they do with it and this way you impact the business metrics with content only right so let's summarize uh, you should make your content decisions early having in mind the goals and plans and metrics and stuff like that. Then you should take hold of keys and make them unique because then you can change specific parts of, 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 uh, of the content and make it more adjusted to the situation. Then you should document it somehow to be able to refer back to what the content was where it lives to be able to, to do those things and the point about design and copy tools I believe again like most of the time you can use the same tools low fi tools do some bad designs anything that will get your message across and the copy tools are good later on or even after launching a feature and the last thing about making it strategic making having this strategic thinking in mind um, to, to impact your business. So I would say start writing on the copy and play with it and it will deliver you the results and then use epics and you will avoid an epic fail. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, hi, I've got a quite simple question. What kind of measurements you usually uh, set on, on the beginning of the, let's say, kind of the project or you use in your work besides the conversion? Uh, yeah, that's a very good one. Uh, because you can get trapped into thinking about conversion only. So I would say it's even more high level thinking about all the scenarios that your development can impact, all the things that are now the business had in mind. And it doesn't have to be even a number. It can be like 
I'd like to avoid people churning. I would like to, to see some kind of engagement in the app, or maybe not. Maybe you just want them to, I don't know, acknowledge the change, right? So, so there's many things you can, things you can expect to happen, and it's good to plan in advance, like every possible scenario from this workflow point of view and the consequences of it. I hope I answered that. Anyone else? OK, so I've got a question for you. Design tokens, keys, unique keys, and so on and so on. It's becoming challenging and, and noisy. How would you suggest people who are starting doing this make this in proper way to not be like confused, totally confused, and not screw up the, the situation? Yeah, I think. The key is always to uh, collaborate with your team, right? So if you have the developers close by, they talk about with them about their ways of working and um, what's already in uh, the company, it will uh, be the best way. So in my example, at my first company, we had some localization tool, which we stopped using at some point. But it was still useful for me to change this original English uh, version of the app. So we were in sync. Like I told the, asked the developers to maybe keep the tool, if that's possible, to be able to make those changes. So I would say it's, that's the way to go. Like maybe don't impose some ways of working, but reuse, make um, use of, of the things used in your company. Okay, and I guess the one, single source of true, as always, is a key for us to have the one place with all the documentation. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's often a struggle as well. So I heard uh, many times having this spreadsheet and Figma, like which is the final. So yeah, thank you.